are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in to one of ACC's messages. As you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're on social media, use the hashtag you belong at ACC if God taught you anything during this message. We want to get to know you. So check out our online community by watching our live service at arundelcc.org live. This is where you can interact with other viewers in the chat, fill out a prayer request, and follow along with message notes. And we believe that God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, welcome to ACC, everybody. We are in week three of our Family Matters series. We're talking about families uh, because they matter, and we're talking about matters of the family. So really glad that you're here. Uh, we're going to be talking today uh, about needs that husbands have from their wives. So wives, you're going to get uh, feel a little picked on today, but I will be, be honest in that next week, we're going to do the opposite. So it's going to be, uh, we're equal opportunity toe steppers at this church, and so everyone's going to get something over the next two weeks. I'm really glad you're here. In order to start today, uh, remember, it, it, we're doing an interactive series, which means you can engage with some of the questions I'm asking on stage using your, your cell phone. If you scan this QR code, uh, you can get logged into that interactive element. You can also scan the QR code on that piece of paper in front of you. The very first question is actually already live. So all the ladies in this room, it's a question for you to answer. If you're a lady in this room and you could answer it, the question is, uh, of the words provided, what are the top three that you think are essential in like a godly husband? If you were trying to define a, a perfect husband, what words would you put at the top of that list? All right. So go ahead and do that because I know, ladies, you take a while to make decisions when you have a lot of options. And so, no? Sorry. Maybe that's just in my home. Anyway, here's what I'm going to start with. I'm going to start with this truth that will make the rest of it make sense today, is that men and women are different. Can we all agree on that? The world would love for you to think that men and women are the same, uh, but the truth is that God has made men and women differently. Our brains work differently. We think different things. We have different levels and thresholds of fear and pain and all sorts of things. And, and in order for everything else to make sense, I have to establish first some of the differences that we have between us. Uh, let me give you a really good example. And all the things I'm going to say right here on this list, these are like scientifically proven. People look at like brain scans and surveys and all sorts of things to establish these things to be true. One of the things that we've noticed that are different between men and women is women have better peripheral vision. All right. They, uh, they get uh, hit. Uh, from the side less often than men do in the car. Believe it or not, they have better peripheral vision. Men have better uh, long-range vision, which makes them better night drivers. I would argue just better drivers, but uh, <laughs> technically better drivers at night. So, so this is one of the reasons, right, when ladies, when you ask your husband to go get something out of the fridge and he gets up to the fridge, one of the things you're going to notice is we, first of all, we get into an umpire position. You know, we look in there. And we're looking for whatever it is. We're looking for the stick of butter that you just asked us to get. And oftentimes, because we're better at long-range vision, uh, we don't see what's right in front of our eyes. In fact, guys, a little tip for you. When your wife says, get the butter out of the fridge, just step back like eight feet. <laughs> and you'll see it. It's right there, right in front of you, okay? And so that's one difference. Uh, another big difference between men and women uh, believe it or not, is women are much, much better, scientifically proven, at multitasking than men are. Men are really good at focusing on one thing and getting that one thing done, while women, they could be brushing their teeth, caring for a kid, combing their hair, and doing eight things, driving and putting on, you know, mascara at the same time. Men can't do that. In fact, they've, they've done brain scans that actually prove that men are virtually deaf when they're reading. So if I have a book out or I'm reading something on my phone or whatever, a, a newspaper, and, and my wife is talking at me and she's like, are you even listening to me? The answer is no. No, I'm not. Like my brain can't hear you because I'm so focused. I, I can't multitask the way you can. So that's one difference. Uh, how about this? You know, men, again, this is scientifically proven stuff here. You can go to the library, look this stuff up on Google. Men can actually think about nothing. 
it's really real. When you ask your husband, what are you thinking about? And he says, nothing. Really what he's thinking about, I'll be honest, what he's really saying is, I was thinking about nothing and you just ruined it, right? <laughs> like I was, I was in a sweet spot and now I'm thinking about what I was thinking about and I wasn't thinking about anything, right? Women, your brains work differently. You're, you're thinking about a whole bunch of things all at once. In fact, even when you sleep, brain scans so that your brain is, all, is still at 70% of its normal activity while you're sleeping. So men and women, our brains are different in that way. Let's talk about words uh, per day, all right? The difference between men and women. Women speak on average 20,000 words per day. 20,000 words per day. Men, on average, 7,000 words per day. Less than half. So sometimes what happens is men come home after a day of work and their wife is saying, hey, tell me about your day. Tell me about this. Talk to me. And frankly, he's already out of words. Like he's already used them all up. And so if you want to know uh, something, you want to have a long, deep conversation, have it in the morning Well, he gets 7,000 words to use with you. And then when he goes to work, he'll be real quiet. All right. But that's the difference. We, we talk less. You know, women see more colors than men, which means uh, that we're not as sharp as dressers. Probably. I, I know that's true for me. Our bone strength, our muscle strength, our bone density, our fear and pain thresholds are, are bigger than women on average. And, and so here, here's my point. God made men and women differently. And that's not something we should be ashamed of or afraid to admit from stage. We are different. Wives, you are different than your husbands. Husbands, you are different than your wives. Unmarried men and women, your, your future spouse, if God's called you into marriage, they're going to be different than you. And so you shouldn't expect them to think about things the same way you do and want to talk about things the same way you do and want to cry at the same movies that you want to cry when you watch, right? They're, we're different, and that's okay. And so one of the, the keys to a happy marriage is recognizing your differences and then aligning your expectations to those differences and aligning your actions to those differences. If you can align your expectations and your actions accordingly, you will find that you are able to experience a healthier, happier marriage. Now let's talk about the word expectations first. I'm gonna, you see that, that word expectations. The first thing we need to talk about this morning is how to align our expectations with reality so that we can have a happier, healthier marriage. All right? And so with that in mind, um, you know what all arguments have in common? Every argument you've ever had with anybody, every frustration you've ever had, experienced in your life, they all have one thing in common, and it's unmet expectations. You had an expectation, and your friend, your spouse, your partner, your whatever, you're, you, you, weren't, you didn't line up. And so you're, you had an argument and an unmet expectation, and, and that's what happened. And so if we can line our, ex, if we have reasonable expectations in marriage, recognizing the difference between men and women, you will have a healthier marriage. All right, in fact, I want to, uh, I asked the ladies to ask, uh, answer that question on your phones. Uh, if we could pop up the results, some of you probably are still answering. But the overwhelming favorite is ladies, you're saying, and an ideal husband is going to be loving. That makes sense right? In fact, God calls men to love their wives. That's the one thing, right? It says women, wives respect your husbands, but uh, uh, husbands love your wives as Christ loves the church. So you're wanting your husband to be able to do that, right? To love, 79%. Patience uh, was right up there. Loyalty, in other words, I want a man who, and when he gives a vow to me, that he's going to be faithful to me, and that he's going to fulfill certain responsibilities in this marriage, that he's going to do it. He's going to He's going to show up. And so loyalty is there. Uh, leader, uh, good listener, kind, funny, strong. Uh, let's go down. I'm curious where, um, where some of those bottom ones. I don't know if whoever's running this for me. Are we able to see the bottom of the list on this? Maybe not. Oh, there we go. All right. Rich. <laughs> now, you know who you are. If you're like 30 years, 
Did it just work? Wait, what happened? Oh, wow, okay. Well, I will say the attractive 2%, that's like music to my ears. I am so thankful that that's not important to my wife. Um, anyway, all right, so here, here's why I asked this question. We can pull that down. I, um, in different surveys, when, when people ask women of our world, you go out into the world and you ask women to describe their ideal husband, to describe the perfect man, oftentimes what they do is they, they describe a woman. They come back and say, I'm looking for someone who is who's a romantic and in touch with their feelings and isn't afraid to cry and loves to listen when I speak and, and talk back to me. And we're just, and I'm just like, you've just described another lady. <laughs> and so you have these expectations that your husband is going to have certain attributes that are typically aligned with more uh, of a feminine nature. And the problem is, is that you're going you're gonna to find that these unequal expectations are going to cause frustration in your marriage. You know, another difference between men and women is men have uh, a large threshold of comfort within a marriage. The, the, the range of whether or not you'd go up to a man, in fact, they asked 2,000 men, it was the um, Chicago Sun-Times asked 2,000 men if they would remarry their wives. And they asked these men while their wives weren't around, okay? And the men, 78% of them said they would remarry their wives. They were glad to be in their marriage, wanted to, they, 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 they thought the marriage was in a healthy enough place that they would do it again. Now, when you ask the wives whether well, husbands weren't around, only 50% of the wives said they would remarry their husbands. And here's what this shows me, is that there's, a, there's less of a, a chance that your husband thinks there's a need to work on your marriage. Your husband's probably more comfortable than you are and women sometimes have too small of a window of acceptability in what a healthy marriage is. So men are like, they might be in a marriage that needs work, but they're not willing to see it or admit it, so they don't want to do the work. And women have this really narrow frame of reference of what a healthy marriage looks like. And so uh, their husband is constantly being held to a standard that he's never going to meet. In fact, it's 80% of all divorce filings are filed by women. And so let me... Uh, let me cover one other thing before I get into the meat of my message. Number one, there is such a thing as toxic masculinity. That's a, a phrase that's being passed around in the world today, this toxic masculinity. And I just want you to understand, there, there, I'm sure there is. Is there toxic masculinity? Yes. There's certainly a way a man can behave that is toxic, ungodly, unholy, all those things. And we should wholeheartedly as a church and as a, as a race of humans to say that's not acceptable and it's not okay. But what the world is trying to do is take attributes of manhood, differences that God has given to us, and just like the, the things I just covered, and trying to say that all those things, therefore, unless your man is like a woman, that it's toxic masculinity. And the truth is that's not true. Men are different than women and that's okay. We, we complement each other. God created uh, a marriage to, to be between one man and one woman for life. And that you, uh, in, in oneness, you become one and you, you complement each other. The things your wife is great at, uh, you, you, guys, you probably aren't that great at. And the things that you're really good at, your wife probably isn't that great at. And you, you are able to help and create this, this beautiful complementary oneness. Let me read one quote. Uh, from Pastor Mark Gunger, he he runs a, a marriage conference and seminar, and he write, writes books on marriage. And this is what he writes: He says, "I now believe that women of the 21st century have completely unrealistic expectations when it comes to living with and dealing with men. I am convinced divorce rates will continue to rise if women do not bring their expectations about marriage." back to reality. Unrealistic expectations are often the culprits responsible for the misery women feel, not their husbands. The unsustainable, unreasonable, romantic longings of women are ripping marriages apart. So here's why it's important to have our expectations aligned 
with the differences between men and women. Because if you expect your husband to think like and act like and do everything the way a woman does, you're going to constantly be frustrated. If you're expecting your husband to meet all the emotional needs that you have that God did not design him to meet in you, you're going to be frustrated. And it's an unrealistic, unfair expectation for him to change who God's made him to be to meet those needs for you. All right? Now, here's the second part of that sentence. I said the key to a happy marriage is recognizing your differences and aligning your expectations and actions accordingly. So not only do we need to change our expectations, but we need to align our our actions. Have you ever had one of those moments where you have an itch on your back and you can't reach it with your hand? And so you're just hoping in that moment there's someone who cares about you somewhere nearby. I run up to my wife. And I'm like, ooh, 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 right, right above where I, right where I can't, right? And I'm trying to describe where to scratch, and my wife will get it, and it feels so good, doesn't it? Is that one of the best feelings in the world when somebody scratches that itch that you can't reach? It feels so amazing. It's amazing. I will say this. Back scratches in general feel really great, don't they? I love when my wife scratches my back. But I'll tell you when I don't enjoy a back scratch is when my wife is scratching over here when my itch is over here. You know that moment where you're like, no, 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 lower, 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 right? You're like, and here's the deal. Men, what we're going to talk about today is the five respect needs of every man. In other words, what I want you to understand in here today is that men have uh, certain times and places where they have an itch, and if you are a, a wife who wants to be God-honoring and, and follow God's word, it's good for you to know where to scratch when he has an itch. And so I'm going to do my best to describe these five respect needs of every man. Now listen, this message is perfectly set up for our women to feel like they're being picked on today and to walk away feeling discouraged. Just bring your husbands back next week, and I will do the same for them, okay? <laughs> my, my wife and I are going to team teach next week, and we're going to talk about the five love needs of every woman. And so we're going to, like I said, we're going to be equal opportunity offenders on this. All right, five respect needs of every man. Now, notice before we even get into those five needs that the word respect is up there. This is actually an important distinction in scripture between the differences between a husband and a wife. Here's what it says in Ephesians 5.33. So again, I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Notice the different words. Wives are called by God to respect their husbands, and husbands are called by God to love their wives. Now, some people could argue, well, these words are kind of, they mean the same thing. I feel respected through love, and my wife feels loved through respect. I I get it, but here's the point. These words are different for a reason. How do we, uh, how how, how does God call wives, future wives, current wives, uh, to respect their husbands? And why is this word different? You see, men need to feel respected. So what I did this week, I got all of your husbands together in a room, and we wrote down our list of demands. <laughs> That's not true. We didn't really do that. I, I'm going to do my best to speak on behalf of men, knowing every man is different. There's going to be some men in here that are thinking, that's not one of my needs. I don't know what that means. I don't know why I said that. I know I use the word every man. In general, these are the five needs, five itches that men have that in a godly marriage, as we're talking about family matters, wives will want to know about so they know how to, to help and, and, and respect their husband in these ways. Here, let me, uh, let me put it really simply. Wives, your husband wants you to look at him and see Superman. Your husband wants, feels respected when he thinks that you are looking at him as a superhero, where you know, in that moment, your, your husband wants to know, I want to know that my wife feels protected by me, 
that she thinks I'm capable of the things that God has called me to, that she uh, trusts my leadership, that she, all these things, right? You think of Superman, like why do we look up at a superhero and like Superman and say, man, that guy's awesome. Your husband wants to be a superhero in your life. He feels respected when he thinks you look at him that way. And by the way, I also wanna say respect isn't something that's supposed to be earned. The same way, ladies, you don't want love to be conditional, right? You want your husband to love you no matter what. You want your husband to love you on your good days, on your bad days, right when you roll out of bed or after you've spent some time in front of a mirror, right? You want your husband to love you unconditionally, regardless of whether or not you make a mistake or not, you've been a great wife or a terrible wife, whatever. You want to know that that love is unconditional. The same is true of men. Men want to feel respected unconditionally. Now, I know that seems unfair because you're saying respect is something that should be earned. Men should have to do something to get my respect. I don't just respect anybody. But let me, let me explain a couple of things. First, let me tell you what I think a godly man looks like. If you want the, the definition of a godly man, a man who's worthy of, uh, of earned respect, this is what scripture says in 1 Timothy 3. It says, this is a trustworthy saying, if someone aspires to be a church leader, and we'll get back to that part right there in just a moment. It says, he desires an honorable position. So a church leader must be a man whose life is above reproach. He must be faithful to his wife. He must exercise self-control, live wisely, and have a good reputation. He must enjoy having guests in his home, and he must be able to teach, and he must be, uh, not be a heavy drinker or violent. He must be gentle, not quarrelsome, and not love money. He must manage his own family well, having children who respect and obey him. Now, I know what some of you are saying right there is that's a list that Paul writes to Timothy about leaders in the church. But let me challenge you on this for just a moment. While this certainly is a list of what a man needs to, to be in order to be a leader within the church— would any of you not want these things for your own son? When you're thinking of your son, you're thinking, well, I, I, I guess God hasn't called him to be a leader, so I don't mind if he's a drunkard. No, right? You want your, you look at this list to be above reproach, to be faithful to his wife, to exercise self-control, to live wisely. These are all things that we want from any young man and that we have influence over. This is a list of what a godly man looks like. So guys, listen, you got a pretty big, uh, you know, task. This is what it looks like to live as a godly man. But the challenge to our, our wives is we want you to know right up front, there's not a single perfect man in this room. We are all going to fail at this. We're going to try really, really hard to do the best we can, some of us more than others. Some of us aren't even trying to accomplish these things. But at the end of the day, the respect that is important to a healthy marriage needs to be unconditional. It's not related to whether or not we've got this nailed down or we don't. If you want to see your marriage thrive and your marriage be healthy, you're going you're to show respect even when we don't land this plane perfectly. All right. If your husband falls short, which he will, Respect is still important. So what are the five respect needs of every man? Five respect needs of every man. Number one, if you're taking notes and you got your fill in the blanks this morning, go ahead and write affirmation of leadership. Affirmation of leadership. In other words, your husband will feel respected in your marriage when you affirm his God-given right to lead within the family unit. I know that makes a lot of people in this room maybe uncomfortable. And you, you, the moment I said that, you're like, you know what? I don't like it. I, again, I don't, I don't apologize for what God's word says. Here's what God's word says about this. In Ephesians 5, 21, it says, And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So now there's this mutual submission that's talked about. And then it gives us a detail. It says, For wives... This means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. 
He is the savior of his body, the church. And the church submits, or as the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. Now I get it. I know a verse like that is uncomfortable for some people to read, especially as the world outside of these doors is trying to tear apart the family unit, is trying to break down things that we've known for many, many years to be true about the family. We now have a hard time reading a passage like this, but scripture says that one of the ways your husband will feel respected in your marriage is to affirm the leadership role that God has given him in your marriage. It says in Colossians 3, verse 18, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting for those who belong to the Lord. You know, when my wife submits to my authority, when she recognizes and affirms my leadership in our marriage, what I hear are phrases like, Hey, Matt, I trust you. Hey, Matt, I believe that you're going to protect us and guide us in a healthy way. Hey, Matt, I trust your judgment in this way. And by the way, you might think, well, how? My my husband won't lead. I keep trying to give him uh, the ability to lead, or he's a terrible leader. When he leads, he takes us to bad places. And and I know there's a whole lot of arguments that some of you are thinking, but what if, but what if, but what if? And what I want to encourage you to do, sometimes giving your husband the ability to lead is is in the small things. I'll give you an example. When, When my wife and I walk into an airport, we're about to travel somewhere. My wife is very intentional. She doesn't uh, pay attention to where I park, whether or not I parked by the right gate. You know, we walk in, and I'm just like, all right. And I, I lead us. I walk up. I, I'm the one who's like gets chooses the line we stand in. My wife never once looks at a departure or arrival television to know whether or not we're in the right place. Now she's way smarter than I am. I promise you, if she were traveling by herself, she would be able to handle an airport all by herself. It's a very not a very difficult thing to do, right? She would know which way to go, which security checkpoint to go through and find the gate, fine, and she'd get on the plane. She doesn't need my leadership or my help. But we walk into that building and she lets me lead. Hey, let's go to this. We're gonna go right. We're gonna go to, she doesn't even know what gate we're headed to. She just follows me and trusts we're sitting in the right seats before we get on a plane. Why? Because she's affirming and giving me an opportunity to lead. She's affirming my leadership role in our marriage. Small, but it speaks volumes. I wrote down when a man, when a husband feels respected in this way, he will step up and even empower his wife to influence him positively. It actually shows us this in scripture in 1 Peter 3. It says, in the same way, you wives must accept the authority of your husbands. Then even if some refuse to obey the good news. So even if you have a husband who, who doesn't follow Jesus, isn't doing what he's supposed to do, it says, even if some refuse to obey the good news, your godly lives will speak to them without any words. And they will be won over by observing your pure and reverent lives. It says a lot. What about this? Um, you might be thinking, well, why? Why does God's word give men the uh, a job of, of leadership within the family? And we're, we're unapologetic about this truth of this church. We're a complementarian church. We believe that men have been called to lead in the family. Why do we believe that? Why did God decide that? We actually see an answer to that in Genesis chapter 3. Right after Adam and Eve have eaten from the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and God shows up and he's doling out some words of, of punishment for the actions. And he says this to the woman in verse 16. To Eve, he says, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy, and in pain you will give birth. And you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. You know, it wasn't always this way. But we go back to the fall and we realize that in that moment, one of the things that that God says, Eve, you ate first and then gave this to your husband. And from now on, I'm going to place him in authority over families all the way up until now. All right. So one of the ways that we respect, uh, wives respect their husbands is simply put to affirm their leadership. Number two is a validation of identity. 
to validate their God-given abilities, to validate the purpose that God has for them in their life, to recognize and see something in them that they probably yet can't even see in themselves. I'll give you some examples of where God does that for people, but first let me share a statistic with you. You know that 75% of men struggle with imposter syndrome. 75% of men, whatever it is that they're doing right now in their life, the job that they have, the thing that they feel called to, their, their role as a husband or a father in the family, they, they don't believe that they're capable of doing that job with excellence, that they're suited for that job, that they can do it with any sort of competency. They feel like imposters in the job that God has called them to. And guess what? One of the ways you can show respect to your husband, and my wife does this so well. She does all these things really well, but she is so good at constantly speaking words of affirmation into me, saying, you are like not only good at this, you are amazing at this thing that God's called you to do. You are, uh, I'm so glad you're able to handle this for our family. You did such a good job with this. And she's constantly uh, calling out of me what I might not even yet see in myself. A validation of identity. You know that men really have to have a purpose that they're running after to thrive. If men don't have something that they're pursuing, an adventure that they're living, they are not going to be in a healthy place. And so when your husband has a, a something that's in the future, something that he's running after, something that he's pursuing, an adventure that he's living, a, a wife that comes in and affirms that and says, listen, I, I, I trust that this is a God-given thing and that you are, he's going to call and, and qualify you to do this with excellence. I see it in you. Your husband will feel respected with those words. Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are God's masterpiece and he has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do good things he planned for us long ago. God has called your husband to good things. And if you can affirm those things in him, he will feel loved and respected. And let me show you again how God modeled this. Remember Abram, before his name was changed to Abraham. Abraham basically means the, the father of multitudes. You know that God went up to Abram and he was a, a coward, right? Telling his wife to pretend that she was his sister because he was afraid of the king. And, and God goes up to this coward Abram and calls him Abraham before he was a father of many, before he was a father of any. God saw in him his purpose and called him by that name. What about Gideon? You know, God called Gideon while Gideon was afraid and hiding in a cave. God goes up to Gideon and calls him a mighty man of valor. Ladies, your husband might not be living a valiant life. He might not do, be doing anything respectable or awesome. You simply going up to him and affirming what, what could be the God-given purpose for his life and say, you are a mighty man of valor. Can, can trigger something that gets him moving in a healthy direction towards the purpose that God has given him in his life. I wrote another example. What about Jesus speaking to Peter? You know, Peter's denied Jesus three times at this point. And what, is, what does Jesus go up and say to Peter? He says, Peter, you are the rock. And on this rock, I'm gonna build my church. Guys, how many of you would love to have your wives point at you next time you're standing in front of the mirror with your shirt off and tell you, you are the rock. Yeah, I don't know. I, I would speak volumes in my home, right? So I want to challenge you to affirm him publicly. Your husband might not admit that he speaks the love language of words of affirmation, but I promise you men speak this language or they, they receive this language more than, than they know. A word of affirmation goes so far with your husband. I want to also encourage you never to criticize him publicly. Never speak poor of your husband in front of other people. You want to turn your husband bitter and angry and, and see a coldness? This is how you're going to do it. You're going to talk about him poorly in front of other people. 
Now I understand, maybe you're like, I need, I need to be able to go to a girlfriend. I need to be able to have someone I can confide in when I'm having issues with my marriage or my husband. I wanna be able to know there's a safe place to go and talk. Listen, our rule here at ACC is if a person's not part of the problem or part of the solution, they have no, they shouldn't be in your business. That's called gossip, right? If they're part of the problem, then you can go to them and talk to them about something. If they're part of the solution, you can go and talk to them. And sometimes I admit that having a safe place that you can go, a, a girlfriend that you can go and talk to about your husband, that that might actually be part of the solution, that you can have a girlfriend speak wisdom back to you and reaffirm how awesome marriage is and how awesome your husband is and how awesome you are. And you might need to hear those words. So as, as a kind of a, a, a good rule, let's say it's, it's good to have a, one place that you can go, ladies, and talk to another woman about your husband and be honest about how things are going in your marriage. But I would recommend, not recommend, a, a very strong recommendation that that person needs to be a follower of Jesus and an advocate of your marriage. If you're going and running your mouth to someone who's constantly telling you, you should leave him, you should leave him, you should leave him, that's the wrong person. They're not part of the solution they're part of the problem and they really shouldn't be part of this conversation at all, okay? Number three, let's get spicy. Um, <laughs> number three, physical desire. Another way, another itch, all right, that your husband has is a, is a desire uh, for physical uh, touch, the physical, uh, just to know that he's desirable and attractive to you. Here's what I wrote down. I had to write it down because I, yeah, I said the ultimate ego boost of a man's life is when his wife willingly and enthusiastically makes love to him. I'm telling you, I know it might seem crass and some of you are like, oh, it got real quiet in here. That's weird. <laughs> it's true. When you willingly and enthusiastically make love to your husband. I'm telling you, nothing is a better ego boost. In his, nothing speaks more respect into who you think that he is in that moment. And the opposition, the, the opposite of that, is some of you are like, listen, uh, yeah, there is no ego boost. If you're making love to your wife while she's counting ceiling tiles and asking you, are you finished yet? Like that, that's not an ego boost at all. That's the opposite. That's a way, again, to, to say to your husband, I don't respect your needs. And I, could you, I have other things I need that are more important to me. Could you move on? So regular, enthusiastic, genuine lovemaking is a very important part of a healthy marriage where you will meet this respect need of your husband. Show genuine desire for physical intimacy. Affirm his attractiveness and his desirability. Listen, you know what's incredible? My wife tells me all the time that she thinks I'm the most attractive man she's ever met. She's a really good liar. <laughs> but she's also a really good actor, actress, and I believe it. Like, I, I know that I'm not the most attractive man or even near the top, but in my wife's words with what she says, I know that I am, I believe, and I know to be true. I don't believe my wife is lying. I know that she finds me attractive and that she desires me physically. And it is such an incredible ego boost and a healthy part of our marriage. You just might need to work on your acting skills, ladies. 1 Corinthians 7 says it this way. The husband should fulfill his wife's sexual needs. We're going to talk more about that next week. And the wife should fulfill her husband's needs. The wife gives authority over her body to her husband, and the husband gives authority over his body to his wife. Do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so that you can give yourselves more completely to prayer. If you have a sexless marriage, uh, according to scripture, it should be because you've decided together that you're going to pause for a limited time for prayer. And if that's not what's going on, there's a problem. Your husband's not feeling respected through your desire to uh, uh, meet his physical desire. It says, afterward, you should come together again so that Satan won't be able to tempt you 
because of your lack of self-control. Let me uh, get a little bit more practical and uncomfortable for just a moment. Oftentimes, I have people in my office in marital counseling, and the question comes up, well, how, uh, how often, you know, we haven't had sex in so long. How often should a, a married couple be having sex? What's, what's normal? Are we weird? Or is this normal? We've been married for this long? It can't be. And listen, here's, here's what I would say I've learned and I think is a healthy minimum in a marriage. Now, every marriage is different. Every, uh, every body is different. Some of us are older than others and things change over time. But I would say you should be striving to have intimate relations within your marriage a minimum of two times per week. Again, that's not true for everyone. There's gonna be reasons why that can't work and maybe you gotta get more creative and now that intimacy looks in your marriage. But some of you are thinking two times. Some of you newlyweds in here right now, you're like, I'm at 14, is that good? <laughs> I'm like, listen, Let me just say this, the more the better, but as a, as a rule of thumb, like what does a healthy marriage look like on a weekly basis? I think you should be meeting each other's needs and shooting for two times per week at a minimum. All right, that was awkward, but let's. <laughs> um, one, more, one more thing with point three before I move on. One of the reasons that physical desire is so important is it shows your husband that he is a priority to you. Let me put it this way. There's often times where uh, a wife will, she'll get her hair done and put makeup on and put her nice outfit on to go out and spend time with other people. Go out with the ladies for a night out on the town or go to work to make a presentation and all her coworkers are gonna be there. So she'll, she'll get all dolled up and look really pretty for them, but she hasn't done that for her husband in who knows how long. And I'll, I'll say, as a husband, what that communicates is it's more important that you uh, are physically attractive and desirable to the world than, than it is apparently to me. So don't let that happen. Number four. Supportive communication. It's important uh, as one of the, the respect needs of a husband that you, you communicate in a way that is supportive and not in a way that tears down. Uh, a lot of women think, listen, I, the reason I insult my husband and I tell him constantly all the reasons why he should be doing things differently and acting differently is because I want him to change. But I promise you, speaking without respect in your tone, uh, you know, insulting your husband, all those things, all it's going to do is create anger and frustration in him. It's going to create disconnectedness, bitterness, and create a, 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 a lack of an emotional connection in your marriage. You want to make sure that the words that you communicate and when you communicate them and what words you say, all those things are important to supportive communication. You want to write in your margins of your notes what I call the three T's of supportive communication. The first T is the text. In other words, the words that you have to say, you wanna choose those in such a way that you're not demeaning, tearing down, or, or, or really insulting your husband. But you wanna say things in a way that are affirming him, that are calling out the good things you see in him. You want the text to be affirming. The second T is tone. You wanna make sure that the tone you use when you, when you communicate is one that shows respect and not one that, that demeans. And the last T is timing. There's a good time to say things and a bad time to say things. And so recognizing the difference of your husband that, hey, right when he comes home from work might be a bad time to have a deep, hard conversation. Right before bed when he's exhausted might be a bad time to say, hey, I wanna talk to you about something. And so there's a, a good text, tone, and timing for supportive communication. Let me show you what scripture says about bad communication. Proverbs 27 says, a quarrelsome wife is as annoying as constant dripping on a rainy day. Stopping her complaints is like trying to stop the wind or trying to hold something with greased hands. Proverbs 21 verse nine says, it is better to live alone in the corner of an attic than with a quarrelsome wife in a lovely home. I read to you Proverbs 21, 19 last week, which says it'd be better to live in a desert 
alone than with a quarrelsome, complaining wife. Here's my point. When we can have not quarrelsome and complaining, but instead supportive communication, you'll create a, a, a healthier marriage and your husband will feel respected. Number five is to create a bandwidth for differences. Here's what I mean by that. Your husband is not a woman. And so if you expect him to, to meet all the needs that you have, some of the emotional needs that you have, it's important that you hear this, ladies, some of the needs that you have, your husband was not designed to meet them. He doesn't have it in him. God didn't make him to be the emotional complement to that need that you have. Some needs that you have, only Jesus is going to be able to meet that need. Some of the needs you have, another girlfriend, a close friend in your life who's a follower of Jesus, you go to her and she'll be able to help scratch that itch that you have. But your husband was not designed to be able to do it. So you need to create a bandwidth to not expect him to be something that God did not design him to be. Another way that you create bandwidth for differences is recognizing in his differences that there's going to be some things that you need to reset some expectations so that you, you have a healthier marriage. Maybe it's uh, creating some space when your husband comes home from work and just saying, hey, the way his mind works in this moment, he needs to decompress. He's out of words. And for me to expect him to come in and, and have a thousand words ready for me, it might not be the healthiest way to, to honor the, the differences we have. Maybe your husband needs uh, a hobby and you need to be okay with it. Maybe your husband needs every once in a while to go out and play a round of golf with other guys. Have you ever noticed a husband can go out and spend all day with another dude on the golf course and then you ask him when he comes back, how's your friend? And he's like, it never came up. I don't know. I don't know how he's doing. Like we're just different and that's okay. Create some bandwidth for those differences. Now let me ask guys, if you look down at your phone, I have an interactive question for you that we're gonna wrap up with today. I'm curious, out of the five things I just mentioned, we'll see them on the screen here. We have affirmation of leadership, validation of identity, uh, <laughs> physical desire, wow. <laughs> Supportive communication, and bandwidth for differences. That's hilarious. As others are answering those questions, it seems to be balancing out a little bit. I think this information is helpful. Once it, you know, everybody gets their answers in, maybe you snap a picture of this and maybe a wives, one of the things you can do at home today, um, you know, specifically just say, hey, of those five things, which one of the ones that speaks the most respect to you? Which one of these things is going to, uh, you know, is, is, is the, 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 the thing that, that really helps you feel respected in our marriage. Probably all five, but it's important to recognize this list. So here, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to uh, put up on the, on the screen our, our What Now God statements. And if you're new to this church, every Sunday we ask God to give us some things that we could do based on this information. And specifically, for our men, let me first challenge you with this. I've already asked your wives to respect you regardless of whether or not you earned it. You're made in the image of God. She married you and gave vows to you, so you already get respect just from that, okay? But why not step up and be a man that's worthy of extra respect? Become the man that God's calling you to be. That's for the men in this room, okay? For the ladies, I wanna give you some practical things this is one man speaking on behalf of other men in this room that would be really meaningful to come from you to us. And you're gonna see this list. It's the first five is on one screen and the next five are on the next screen. So if you wanna take pictures, it, you gotta take two of them. Here it is. Number one, look for opportunities to honor him. Number two, accept that you married an imperfect man. One of the things there I wrote down is, Avoid ever saying, I told you so. Number three, focus on what he does well. Maybe you have a husband that doesn't do very much well. It's very hard to find any way you would want to lead or, or follow this man's leadership. 
But when he does do something well, tell him about it. Focus on those things. Number four, always speak well of him. Now, obviously there's some exceptions of this. If your husband is abusive, if there's something going on in the home and you need to be in a safer place, certainly speak ill of him to someone. Come tell somebody, hey, my husband is not, is not a safe place to be, that's okay. But in, in general, speak well of your husband. Number five, support his discipline decisions. As he's seeking to, to bring up children in the fear and admonition of the Lord, when he makes a decision, assuming that it's a healthy form of discipline, support his discipline decisions. All right, here's the next five. It's gonna be on the next screen. Number six, encourage him when he directs the family spiritually. Maybe it doesn't happen very often, but once a month, he gets the family around the table and says, hey, open up your Bibles. If that's all that he's doing right now, encourage him and say, hey, that was, that was awesome to see you lead us spiritually that way. We all felt really loved in that way. Number six, consider the three T's, text, tone, and timing. Number eight, tell your children about how awesome their dad is. You, man, that's, uh, that's maybe number two on my list. When my wife tells my daughters how awesome she thinks I am and how awesome uh, they, they, they think I am, when I hear those words, man, it, it fills up my tank for like a week. Number nine, physical touch and regular lovemaking. Guys, you can send me gift cards this week, okay? <laughs> and number 10, pray for him. This is probably the most important one. Pray for your husband. I know we're all in different situations. Some of you have husbands that you wish you, you wanted to respect and follow his leadership. But one of the simple, most simple things you can do for your husband is to pray for him on a regular basis that he would be the man that God's calling him to be, all right? Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for an opportunity to open your word today, to understand the differences between men and women. Thank you that you've made us different so that we can complement each other. God, as, as many women in this room right now might be feeling a weightiness of the words I said, maybe they're feeling broken or discouraged by some of the things I said, but would you comfort them right now and recognize that the purpose of today's message was to, to give each of us some, some new things that we could work on, that, that for the men in this room, that we could step into the role of a godly man that you're calling us to, and for our wives to, to see and, and respect us the way you're calling them to. And so we ask that you would show each of us what it is you want us to do so that we can look more like Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Wow, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in the message today. Please know that we as a church are praying that what you have learned today and the truths that God has put deep into your heart will manifest and grow into something amazing. You can experience that with other believers at ACC on Sunday mornings at 710 Aqua Heart Road. And remember, you belong at ACC.